Good morning, everyone. I'm here with Gustavo. How are you, Gustavo? Doing great, and you? All good, all good. I actually just said good morning, and then and then I realized that it's good evening where I am, it's good afternoon where you are, and then it's good morning where where our guest is. So, who's our guest today, it's a Gustavo? Podcast. Good to be. <laughs> exactly. So our guest today is CK. CK is a long-term investor in, in venture capital. He started in the late 1990s at, at Intel Capital. He's currently the head of Americas for, for Hong Kong Ventures. Hong Kong Ventures is one of the world's best-renowned uh, corporate venture capital programs. Having invested in, actually, they have now 150 active portfolio companies, having done over 20 exits over a billion dollars. So very, very successful investors. CK, we're happy to have you here. Thank you guys for the opportunity to chat uh, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, my experience, talk about Qualcomm Ventures, talk about uh, investment environment in LATAM and in the US and globally, uh, as you mentioned, we're a global platform. So we actually have folks uh, on the ground, uh, of course, in the US, both Bay Area and, and here in San Diego, where we are headquartered. Uh, we have folks in China, we have folks in India, we have folks in Israel, uh, folks in London, and uh, folks in Sao Paulo. So uh, global from that perspective, um, the venture business is a is a sort of a relationship business. It's a business of, uh, you know, trying to understand the local peculiarities of every market. So it's important for us to have partners around the globe in the key markets where, you uh, you know, our technologies are consumed where people are building solutions on top of our technologies, where we can learn from entrepreneurs, learn from uh, startups and where we can, you know, effectively partner with them uh, uh, and, you know, hopefully make uh, one plus one five. <laughs> Carlos, we usually like to talk more about the, about, the, about the person and the professional to begin with. So tell us a bit about your background. Where, where did you grow up? Uh, what did you study? What did you do after school? And then we can get into more the more professional part. Good. So, uh, as you can tell by my looks, I'm Brazilian. Uh, I was uh, <laughs> born and raised in Brazil. Uh, you know, European parents, uh, but but basically born and raised in Brazil. Went to engineering school there. I'm a chemi chemi by training, chem engineer. Um, and maybe worked the first five, six, seven years of my career as a chem engineer in. Uh, operating environments and design environments, et cetera. Actually came up to the U.S. Uh, to get a master's in chem engineering. Um, after the master's, I got a job um, in the, uh, the euphemism is oil, uh, energy industry. It was actually the oil industry, but, but they call it energy. It sounds better. Uh, it's more, and, more uh, ESG friendly. It's more ESG friendly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And uh, then I got my MBA, uh, and after my MBA, I pivoted sort of into the world of tech and into the world of business development and, and finance. And uh, shortly after my MBA, I sort of joined Intel uh, here in California. Uh, I was here with them for about six, nine months. They shipped me back to Brazil. Uh, and maybe a year into that, we they had decided to sort of uh, expand Intel Capital into LATAM, um, put my name on the hat. You know, they went through a selection process, etc., and uh, ended up getting the job. So I basically started Intel Capital's practice in LATAM. This is very late 99, um, you know, before the bubble burst. Uh, we made some investments. Uh, some of them actually got out in time. Some of them got out, in, got out but not in time for the <laughs> bubble uh, to burst. So it was certainly a you know fascinating learning experience. It was fascinating to see, uh, you know, basically I, it, the the region hadn't seen much of venture capital until then, right? Um, as you probably I may may not remember, but uh, you know the region in general was a very high you know history of high hyperinflation. So people worried about. Uh, where to invest money for tomorrow. Uh, you know, there's a lot of overnight transactions, not longer term uh, transactions. But, you know, throughout the 90s, the region in, in general cleaned up its act, uh, became more fiscally responsible. So it kind of makes sense. The private equity industry started to invest in the region. There was a lot of privatizations. And again, some folks started to dabble at uh, tech investing because what's interesting uh, is... 
lot of markets have local needs, local problems, right? And the best folks to build solutions around those problems are the local entrepreneurs. So, uh, and that's where we were investing in basically how can we get more connected systems, more broadband, uh, uh, you know, integrators, uh, things like that. Um, so, you know, the start of the mobile mobile internet very early on in the early 2000s, uh, you know, was still the, something called the WAP protocol, uh, you know, before before 3G was real, et cetera. So anyway, I, I did that, uh, then came back to the U.S. I was with Intel Capital in Austin for, for about three years, did investments sort of in that part of the country. Uh, then I left, uh, joined a one of the few VC firms in Brazil at the time, and uh, as a partner re- running a tech fund and a climate, or sorry, we called it clean tech fund back then. Um, timing wasn't wonderful. This was uh, 07, 08, 09 when the world was falling apart. Um, and, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, at one point I threw in the towel and shortly thereafter, we, uh, I signed up with Qualcomm Ventures to start our operation there. Um, ran that team basically for uh, about five and a half years. We did a lot of exciting investments. Uh, it was great to see the transition of how the industry matured in terms of VCs, entrepreneurs, uh, service providers, everything. It was night and day compared to what it was in like in the late 90s, early 2000s. So much more mature ecosystem, uh, outstanding, you know, investors, co-investors, uh, running funds and entrepreneurs. And about uh, five years ago, I moved back up here uh, and I'm currently running Americas for us. So the US team, and the Latin team, investment team, BD team, et cetera. So it's been a great journey uh, from a sort of a engineer uh, to more of a business person and investor. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, certainly very exciting to see how you still apply your sort of engineering understanding of how things work and uh, yeah, things like that on a day-to-day basis. Amazing story. Just, I have to ask this because it's a, it's a personal uh, curiosity. How was Intel at that time? Oh, Intel, this was, uh, um, this was uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. Intel was definitely a powerhouse, right? Intel was sort of at the cusp of the, um, of the sort of the PC revolution, internet, et cetera. So, uh, you know, a uh, very, very you know, strong leader in, in the area of, of compute in general, uh, certainly on the client. They were growing their business uh, on the server side of things. So they were developing uh, chips for servers. Servers became the norm with a cloud, with the whole cloud infrastructure, you know, up until, you know, maybe five years ago, four years ago, uh, we're running largely on x86 servers, right? So... Uh, it was a huge, huge transformation uh, of the company, and, and it was a you know, great school, great folks, great company. Um, you know, had a good time there investing. Uh, again, some of the investments we made, again, as I mentioned earlier, how do we advance broadband? Initially, wired and wireless broadband. Um, how do we make uh, uh, solutions running on on Intel servers better, etc. You have to remember, maybe not, you guys are younger than me. But, you know, Sun Microsystems was the gold standard for servers back in the late 90s and early 2000s, right? Um, So uh, people were looking to, you know, again, that was the sort of the safe choice and Intel was trying to get into the market. Intel was also trying to get into the sort of communications market. Again, it started out largely as a compute company. So they was trying to expand with the Internet. You want to be connected. So they made several acquisitions and multiple different uh, uh, solutions for basically uh, networking appliances, if you will. And again, we we at Intel Capital were investing in companies uh, that could be the next big thing. Um, interesting, interesting data points. For example, Broadcom was actually an Intel Capital investment early on, right? All Broadcom went on to become a powerhouse, but that's just one example of a company that... Uh, you know, uh, started in the 90s and uh, uh, was actually an investment uh, done by Intel Capital. Amazing. And how, and how different was tech back then? Uh, we've all read uh, only the paranoid survived from Ken Grove and those were the Ken Grove years. Um, yeah. Intel was at the center of the yeah. game at the time. 
Yes. Uh, so uh, the, the the environment was. We were in a similar moment to where we are today, right? Uh, the advent of the internet was this next big thing. And, you know, fast forward 20 years, 20, 25 years, it really has become, uh, you know, a totally interconnected world where everybody does everything online. You don't step more, you know, anymore in a, in a branch in a bank. Uh, you do, you know, your, your stock transactions, you do everything online. Uh, you know, it used to be everything, pen, paper, maybe telephone, right? And, uh, you know, the internet changed that uh, with, you know, examples in, in every industry, right? Uh, obviously, e-commerce, uh, one, one key application, but behind e-commerce, you have logistics, you have supply chain, right? All of that, again, super interconnected. And uh, um, so it was fascinating, the, the sort of the value creation that came out of that moment. Uh, it's just uh, literally trillions of dollars. And I think we're now... Ex- in a very similar moment, except that I think we'll think with AI, I think things will happen faster, right? Uh, you'll see, you always see an acceleration of technology adoption, compounding different technologies or convergence of technologies. And, uh, you know, the, the development of AI over the past four or five years, and more specifically over the last uh, one, two years with generative AI, is just fascinating. Right. So, again, the number of industries that will be transformed uh, is, uh, you know, it it will touch everything. It will touch education. It will will touch healthcare, It will touch, uh, you know, entertainment. Um, uh, Every, 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 every aspect, every industry uh, will be touched. And uh, I think we're in a very similar moment again of a big boom uh, ahead of us. And you've been. So you think, Carlos, it's 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 like you consider it, and you guys at Qualcomm to be like a big paradigm change, similar to what cloud mobile and and the rest of the industries and the rest of the technology advancements represented, right? Yeah, definitely. So I I, I used to say that cloud and mobile is like a marriage made in heaven, right? Because uh, uh, mobile was really amplified by cloud and vice versa. Uh, and uh, I think, again, with AI now, we're seeing AI, a lot of AI done on the cloud with training and, and, and inference. But more and more at Qualcomm, we believe that, you know, a lot of the inference, a lot of the AI compute should be done on the device and the edge uh, for various reasons, cost, uh, privacy, latency, uh, et cetera. So, it's a, you know, it's not either or. We, we, uh, we sort of think of this uh, hybrid uh, AI uh, models where part of them, part of that's done on the cloud, part of that's done on the device, but more and more again we'll see uh, uh, things done. You know, the compute done, the intelligence uh, done on on the device on the edge itself, uh, and that bodes very well for for a company like Qualcomm, which you know develops uh, high performance, low power solutions uh, to the what we call the connected intelligent edge. Right. So again. Take retail industry, take uh, take logistics, take uh, energy, take you name it. Any in, industrial in general, right? All of these you see more and more uh, the ability to collect data with uh, sort of sensors and then process that data locally, generate insights and make decisions on the fly on the device. Uh, that will help you, you know, run more efficiently, uh, save energy, save, uh, you name it, the, 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 the implications and the outcome of these uh, models will be just fascinating, right? It's really, it's really data generation 24-7, uh, you know, uh, every, every second, multiple cycles, et cetera, and the ability to process that, it's uh, fascinating. And other than from an infrastructure point of view, how do you see that playing out in the future? I mean, social, economic, envi- uh, uh, employment issues, um, the countries, and so far. Uh, you know, there's as you probably seen, and there's lots of people talking about this. There's always two sides to a coin, right? Uh, the the technology can be applied for greatness, and the technology can be applied for bad. Um, in general. We think that AI will augment our capacity, human capacity, to develop new things. 
uh, and will be like a co-pilot making you know uh, your ability to learn to absorb new new concepts and to operate much much better um, and and uh, you know the impact of that will be a significant boost in productivity uh, and in wealth creation overall now uh, just like every technology that came about, there will be displacement of, uh, you know, specific uh, jobs, positions, right? Um, but you know, the good news is folks reinvent themselves, uh, you know, with some training, with some help. Um, you know, we will see, I think, uh, definitely, again, some, 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 some displacement. But if, if, if run well... Uh, this could be very positive, right? Short term, it always creates some anxiety. Uh, longer term, I think uh, I have a lot of optimism for how things uh, will evolve and will be better uh, with AI than without. And AI. when we compare, I mean, I want to go back to the beginning later, but seizing this opportunity, right? You've been through the cycles of mobile, of cloud, of robotics, of the, the broadband and so forth. And they've all been as transformational to the world. Uh, as one may think AI will become, uh, what would be the changes? Is it the acceleration, like much faster? Or are there other ones? Yeah, I think, I think you'll see, you know, for example, we're using AI on our day-to-day -day job now to learn about a certain space, the competitive landscape of a startup we're looking at, et cetera. It's much easier to do research, right, much quicker, uh, so you can get up to speed much faster. Uh, again, it just means efficiency, which means you can do more in the same amount of time or you can do, you know, uh, more and have more leisure time. It, it's up to you, right? So, uh, again, there's all this question about uh, whether jobs will be, uh, you know, uh, eliminated. Uh, and, again, I think some jobs will be uh uh, made more redundant over time, right? But the new new things will be created. When you think about, uh, um, you know, any any big technology transition, right? The automobile initially there were there were uh, you know drivers. Then people learned how to drive. Uh, uh, you know, when you think about. Uh, uh, the typewriter again. The type uh, the typewriter got supplanted by the word processor, right? Um, and people went on to do different things and better things. Uh, and they, in general, were the net positive for society. So I think it's the same thing here. Obviously, the ramifications and the implications of AI is much broader than a single you know sliver, a single industry, single use case, right? So in that standpoint. Um, uh, maybe there will be more turbulence, more things to worry about on how to how to address and how to contain and how to fix, right? Um, so certainly will be more challenging, more uh, quote unquote exciting from that standpoint. But as I mentioned earlier, not not I'm super uh, uh, super optimistic that this is this is all a very positive uh, you know function in terms of creating generating productivity. Right, and then again, it it gets applied to gets applied to um, all sorts of things, which means that in general, you reduce cost to deliver uh, services, to bring new technologies, uh, to develop new manufacturing. Right, so the cost of things should come down uh, over time, and with that, uh, some some key technologies will be more accessible to more people in general, improving the quality of lives of folks uh, throughout the globe, right? Um, maybe a, an analogy here is, uh, as you know, in many geographies, uh, wireless communications, effectively cellular, supplanted fixed lines in, like, in continents like Africa, right? Africa didn't have much of an infrastructure for fixed lines and actually ended up not doing much of an infrastructure because the wireless, the cellular technology uh, made it much more democratic for people to be uh, communicating at a much lower cost. So you can draw some parallels here again on the impact of the technology. And as I mentioned earlier, I think the ramifications are much, much broader and much, much deeper. Great.
Great, fantastic. So let's go back in time now. Uh, you came to Latin America to invest in venture capital in the late 1990s, working for a U.S. fund or a U.S. corporate venture capital fund. Um, how was that? I mean, it was pre-bubble, then you went through the bubble, then after the bubble. Uh, how was that beginning of the career for you? Yeah, it was bubble already. It was pre-bubble burst, <laughs> but it was bubble certainly, right? I remember turning on the TV in 1997, 1998, every night there was like all these IPOs, every stock popping, you know, 70% the first day and, uh, you know, one IPO after the other uh, and all that. So, so one question, Carlos, when you were seeing on the news, like what was going on in 2021 and early 20, so 2020 and 2021, I mean, were you seeing like the same signs and with all the SPACs and all of that, and all of the IPOs and thinking this I, resonates? I, I think, yeah, the short answer is yes, but there was a bit of denial, right? There was... There always uh, is some denial, denial, right? I mean, what I'm trying to get to is... <clears throat> There is always some thought that, you know, it's different now. As I mentioned, I, you know, use the term of convergence of technologies a few minutes ago, right? I mean, clearly what we have today is much more powerful than what we had 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, right? I mean, my first investments, going back to how was it, uh, you know, my first investment in Intel Capital was Paragon.com, which you guys may know was bought by Banco Santander, uh, you know, for a hefty amount of $750 million, uh, you know, in, uh, what is it, March of 2000, right? Before the bubble burst, right? Uh, and uh, I remember doing due diligence and literally we were talking about eyeballs and we were talking about, you know, users in the thousands, right? So the, the, the impact, the, 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 the death of the internet was so sh shallow. There were so few people users. It was a hope, right? And fast forward 2020, 2021, I mean, you have, you have, like I said, trillions of dollars of value creation of new companies that came out of this thing called internet, right? And the infrastructure, uh, you know, to, to make it run. Uh, and so you think, hey, now the internet, you know, there is like over half the globe has access to is connected and people are transacting and companies are transacting, you know, billions of dollars over the Internet, et cetera. So it's very different, very robust. And it's like, oh, OK, so now it's different. And technology, creation of technology and adoption is accelerating. So when we saw expansion in multiples, we were like, well, maybe this is a new reality. Right. Maybe this is a, a new world where. Indeed, uh, you know, there's a, you know, more value creation faster, right? So that's the sort of the denial. What we tend to forget is, you know, I remember saying 2016, the, mar the markets are expensive. 2017, getting more expensive. 2018, getting, right? And, you know, when it came to 21, it was just totally nuts, right? It was absolutely nuts. So the correction that we saw last year, um, no doubt it was going to happen. I, I must confess it was bigger sort of than what I expected. I think the key culprit in my personal view, and I'm not, uh, I'm not an economist or anything like that, but I think the inflation uh, really, really, uh, inflation and the increase, increase in interest rates, right, uh, really put an end to the party. Uh, we've gone for almost 15 years of zero free, you know, uh, of free capital in the world, right? So no doubt, again, that uh, the, the valuations got out of whack and, and things were out of whack. So those those better multiples that we saw, uh, I think we'll get, we'll get back to, you know, some expansion, right? I think right now we're still uh, just in general nervous of what's going on, you know, how how much longer inflation will be around, how much longer interest rates will be at this level. But I don't think we're going back to a world where you know, interest rates were uh, effectively free, if you will, right? I, th I think uh, that, that works. And was well. that temple as big as, that, as, as the one today? Or was it, was it the, the 2021 one uh, shorter than the, the bubble burst? Um, so the bubble burst, again, some point in 2000, um, 
and the sort of the people call it, especially in telecom, right? Because there's a lot of investments in telecom in the in the sort of the first wave of the internet because it was the infrastructure, right? It was the plumbing. So there were all these cable companies, uh, you know, intra intra continental connections, etc. Uh, so there was in fiber, lay fiber everywhere. So in many senses, uh, uh, there was clearly an overinvestment, and people called it sort of the telecom nuclear, uh, you know, uh, aftermath, right? And I think the world went really sideways up until 2004-ish, so maybe uh, three good three four years, right? And the world started to wake up with sort of Google's IPO. And then the following year, they had YouTube uh, acquired by... So the advent or the, the creation of the sort of the web 2.0, right? The user-generated content. Uh, that's when the world started to get excited again uh, and, you know, feel a little more optimistic. And that was, again, circa 2004, 2005. But 2002, 2003... I think most most of 2004 were, were tough years in general. Uh, the investment activity was was uh, significant. And in Latam, it, it started picking up again in 2005 as well. I think Latam really started to pick up uh, in uh, 2009, 2010, 2011. We saw a boom of private equity deals uh, in Brazil in 2005, six, seven. A lot of companies, you know, Brazil has gone through, you know, um, again, uh, interest rates got better. Uh, there was the result of all these privatizations and, you know, more of an open market economy. So people were super bullish on, on Brazil. And so a lot of companies uh, through private equity uh, uh, either, again, got out the uh, private equity exits or via IPO. And, and so that's for more established companies. For tech startups, um, I think it really started to go back, you know, in 2000, closer to 2010, which is where by then, I think the critical mass of internet in, in the region had taken off, right? The, you know, you, and, and people did sort of, you had that wave of e-commerce, a lot of people investing in e-commerce um and then uh again we saw we saw that's when i think kasek formally started their first fund 2009 2010 red point 2011 12 we started 2012 monashis had done it earlier he, they had started 2005 but again they picked up activity big time in 2009 and beyond so i think that's when we really saw um uh, you know Multiple funds focusing on early stage. Uh, many of these new funds were, you know, the partners had been operators, had started companies, um, et cetera. So it was more of a, a Silicon Valley mentality, more founder friendly, uh, et cetera, that, that uh, you know, uh, was different from the first wave of VCs in Brazil, which were sort of uh, typically former bankers, who wanted to raise a private equity firm, but it was too much money. So they raised a uh, sort of a smaller fund and they were doing, trying to do, you know, tech investing, if you will, right? Very different from that first wave. The second wave was significantly more powerful. And then the third wave is, I think started 2000 at some point, I'm, I'm, I'm just picking numbers, right? So give or take one or two years, but late 2017, 2018, uh, is when we started to see again uh, the number of funds multiplying significantly. A lot of people investing earlier stage, uh, etc. When I started Qualcomm Ventures in uh, Brazil, uh, there was like there were funds doing Series A, Series B, but there was not a not a whole lot of people doing pre series like C deals, right? Uh, today, you have multiple, multiple VC firms doing CDLs, pre-CDLs, et cetera. So that part of the ecosystem is good. And the other part of the ecosystem that was, you know, uh, much weaker than it is today was sort of beyond Series B, uh, you know, sort of growth capital, uh, Series C, Series D. And uh, as uh, sort of 
SoftBank and others, you know, uh, came in, started to write larger checks for, you know, later stage companies. And then guys like uh, Kasek did opportunity funds. So basically to invest in some of their successful companies and write bigger checks, et cetera. So overall, the, you know, the system is much more robust, the ecosystem. And uh, I think today is, is pretty complete, I'd say, and- right? We're not seeing a whole lot of exits anywhere, but that's true here in the U.S. as well and, and, and true there as well. And there is no doubt some hangover, right? Because a lot of companies got funded in 2020, 2021 at crazy valuations, like Series A companies at crazy valuations. And now as they need to go back and raise more money, you just can't justify those valuations, right? So you either take a down round uh, or you're probably out of luck, right? So if you really believe in your business and you think you have something, you know, you probably want to take a down round and continue to build the business and hope that, uh, you know, uh, really uh, tap the opportunity uh, thinking more longer term. And from the side of the founders, how different are they today than they were in, in the late 1990s and, and I mean, in those one, two, and three waves. Yeah. So uh, the short answer is significantly more sophisticated, significantly more prepared. And I forgot to mention this. You know, you asked how was it back then. Uh, the reality is, the uh, a few people knew how it works. Entrepreneurs didn't quite know what it means to take a you know have an investor in your uh, cap table, right? What are the sort of the moment you raise money with others, it's no longer your company alone, right? You, you, you have this notion of co-ownership, even if the investors are minority investors, right? They, they have a say on uh, sort of some decisions, you know, you know the more, most basic stuff, budgeting and things like that, right? Because you're basically saying, hey, we're raising whatever, $10 million, this $10 million we think will be good for 18, 24 months. So here's the sort of the budget and here's how many people we're going to hire, et cetera. So, um, but what I'm trying to get to is um, today there's a wealth of information out there, right? There's blogs for this and all sorts of ideas on how to, how to measure something and how to, what's your go to market? What's the smartest way to launch uh, something? You know, should I go product led growth or should I go, you know, uh, the, the, the wealth of content out there is just amazing. And the other thing that's changed substantially is that it's become much cheaper to start a company, right? It literally used to be that you had to connect your, you had to have your on-prem, on-prem server. So you had to go buy a Sun server uh, and, and, you know, maybe a Cisco router. And right there, you know, a lot of money already, right? And today you put your credit card online, uh, go to AWS or, Google Cloud or whoever, and, you know, for whatever, 20 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month, you're connected and you have the infrastructure, right? So it's become a lot easier, cheaper, right, uh, to do it. And there's a lot more content. And as a result, um, again, the, the entrepreneurs are much more sophisticated, uh, have a much better understanding on how to uh quickly try to scale their business. Uh, it's and in terms of boldness and vision, are they bolders now or, or were they bolders in the beginning? I think it's a good, great question. Um, I think the answer again is yes. People have seen the movie play out and are thinking longer term. So a lot of people say, hey, I'm, I'm really facing a huge opportunity here. I'm going to play the longer game, right? Um, I know it's going to take me three, four, five rounds of financing, but I can build something big here and I can build a, you know, billion dollar company um, versus in initially it was like, Hey, here's an opportunity. Somebody's offering me to sell by my company at $30 million at $40 million. Then, you know, no doubt it's a lot of money. Right. But, uh, people used to think shorter term, hey, this is money, this money is good enough, will change my life. Um, that's good, right? I'll, I'll take the MA offer. Um, um, again, just put, putting things in context, uh, the 
30, 40 million exit was they would still make money. Investors would make a little money, but it's not the same thing, right? Now it's a lot more. Let's go all in. Let's try to build a company worth, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or, or, or billions of dollars. So taking your LATAM portfolio, for example, um, if you get 99 taxes, uh, then Quintundar and then Aravita, for example, or Asian, which are newer companies, um, when you compare these companies in similar stages, I mean, 99 had no playbook. These guys were just writing the playbook as they went, uh, developing all the whole infrastructure in Brazil. There was none at the time. Uh, and when you get to the newer stages, they have to develop more comp complex and sophisticated uh, uh, solutions. How do you see all that in your career? Uh, so specifically, maybe... Um, maybe I will disagree with you. 99 had a very clear playbook. Uh, that playbook did change and did augment uh, circa 2014-15, especially after, uh, well, really be after Uber, Uber came in in Brazil. Uber came in, we invested in 2012 or 13. Um, basically entered seed round together with Monashis. Uh, at the time, there were probably, you know, a dozen taxi apps. It was a taxi app. It wasn't like a ride hailing thing. It wasn't uh, like a car sharing, if you will, P2P, right? The so-called peer-to-peer. Uh, uh, and But Paulo had, you know, very clear on how he was going to monetize, right? Said, so I'll build an audience. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll build an audience. It will be free for the first two, three years. I'll build uh, sort of the capability to do in-app payments. And then I'll turn that on. And, you know, the payments will run through through the app. And at that point, I'll take a cut. And that played out beautifully, uh, uh, super well. Again, when Uber came in and basically uh, didn't follow any of the rules, right? Which means, obviously, uh, the Uber service was illegal. Uh 99, you know, wanted to, they had pride themselves in sort of being the, the taxi guy's best friend and helping them do more business and, and, and sort of be more efficient. So they didn't want to betray that. So they fought it for a while and up to a point where they just said, you know what, we have to do this as well, because clearly that's the new game, right? Uh, and so the playbook changed then. And, and this was, again, circa 2015, um, arguably, uh, you know, a year, year and a half late, uh, later than it should have been, right? But that's when Didi Chushin came in as well as an investor in SoftBank, and they had the money and, and very quickly, uh, you know, uh, the business went back to growing a lot. They had a very significant market share of the 12 guys that started out this taxi apps, you know, in the end, it was really... A two race horse between Easy Taxi and 99. Easy, uh, 99 had a sort of a better solution uh, in general, uh, more robust, more efficient. It was preferred by by the users and by the taxi drivers, um, and and so that's that. Um, it, so your question, I'm trying to remember your question uh, specifically I, I, on, on I was mentioning the playbook when it comes to like infrastructure, hiring talent, developing talent. Uh, raising from local funds and global yeah. funds and so forth. So the environment, the ecosystem as a whole, was much less developed at the time uh, than it is now, of course. Yes. But when you get like these three examples, uh, so you have 99 in the very, in the very beginning of this wave of, of venture capital investments in Latam, then you have Quintonab, which is a fantastic company as well, uh, which was developed a little, little later. And, and nowadays you have some newer, newer examples in your portfolio, uh, such as Aravita and Asian, uh, which are much more uh, sophisticated and complex in terms of tech stack and, and, and infrastructure um, when you get to similar stages in the development of the company. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I think, um, let me start with a, sort of a micro view and then go macro. By, by micro, I mean our lens when we, we invest is we are looking for companies that, you know, our playbook is, uh, yes, we are a strategic investor, but we're an investor first. 
So we think and act like a financial investor. Uh, we are looking for companies that we think will scale, that will become big, and that will provide, you know, a strong financial return, risk return, uh, you know, uh, on a risk return adjusted basis, right? Uh, and then we look for companies that we sort of limit our activity to companies that are relevant to us. So we have we put together investment strategies either for geographies or specific sectors. We think that this is what's happening and, uh, you know, these are the things we want to see. So these are the kind of companies we want to back, right? And then we look at that intersection of good, strong financial investments with companies that are relevant to us. And this is important because, again, it allows us to work with those companies and help them and try to grow faster. It's a space we know better than, you know, uh, is it? One good example is, is obviously fintech is huge. We've done very little fintech because the touch points with us is, is again, very limited, right? It doesn't mean that uh, they're not, you know, great uh, investment opportunities. In fact, Nubank arguably is a miss for us. We, we should have invested in Nubank. When I sort of woke up, it was already Series C, and at the time it was a crazy valuation. Uh, you know, hindsight's easy, should have done, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, because the value creation from that point on was still huge, right? Uh, but it was sort of, uh, you know, difficult at the time to, to justify. Uh, but there's few opportunities that sort of in the fintech space that are relevant to us. But 99, Aravita, ASEAN, all of these fit in a strategic sort of objective of ours. The 99 and Quintondar at the time were still about the mobile internet, Right. How can I use the many sensors that I have on my phone uh, to provide a better experience for all inv- inv- you know, involved parties? Uh, Quintandara was similar. A lot of the sort of the transaction, a lot of the communication between the various parties is done on the mobile. And we thought, hey, this is, this is interesting. Fantastic company. Uh, I agree. Uh, amazing team and amazing opportunity, and uh, et cetera. Aravita is sort of uh, is at this intersection of IoT, and an AI. Um, so they are, they're setting out to leverage a lot of data from point of sale and basically, which is effectively your sensor, if you will. And over time, they can actually build upon that, but it's, you know, you got to do one thing at a time um, and, and, and deploy the AI models to make predictions on when to buy, you know, fresh goods, when to buy, how much to buy, uh, et cetera, right? So all of these, ASEAN, ASEAN is basically uh, uh, helping uh, make the internet more uh, uh, dispersed, less cloud-centric. So they're doing a lot of infrastructure at the edge for better, again, user experience. And the user could be a bank, could be an e-commerce site, could be, you know, uh, 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 an industrial business, whatnot. You want to be able to uh, gather the data, serve the data, etc. All, all much better, and, and write applications and run those applications on the edge. So all of these fit in sort of our strategic objectives, right? When we, we, we do that. And, and, you know, and then the decision is, you know, why this company, why this entrepreneur, right? And each of them have their own merits. So for example, I had known Paulo for years from his Endeavor days, um, thought he was a very seasoned guy. And then Paulo and his, you know, the co-founder was like a perfect combination of, uh, you know, a guy, he, entrepreneurs who have tried a number of times, they weren't first timers. Uh, Paulo is a seasoned guy. Uh, the other guys were, again, they had other startups. One was very strong on front end. The other guy was very strong on back end. So it was like this happy combination. And they were winning in the, you know, even though it was early, they were winning in the, the, the market from a sort of having a better solution out there. Again, a more uh, better thought out solution, right? That, that uh, ultimately is what people wanted to use, right? Uh, ASEAN uh, is, you know, Hafa, Hafa basically built an amazing business bootstrapped for several years. And it was like, okay, now it's time to scale and grow faster. So, you know, we uh, uh, raise money. We, you know, basically call it the round uh, that, that, uh, that uh, we did, I think, a couple of years now. And the company, you know, accelerated growth, et cetera. You know, their success is our success. We want to see what ASEAN is doing in more scale because it will be good overall for our, our vision of where we think the world is and, and, and so on and so forth. Right. So 
all of these guys have, you know, they're different in their careers, et cetera, but they have the common stuff of, you know, really thinking big of, uh, you know, wanting to big, uh, you know, that they're solving real problems, right? They're solving it in a smart way. They're solving it in a better way. And, and, and they are in the process of basically, you know, attracting talent, which is part of the challenge, right? Attracting the right talent to grow faster, to basically scale the business faster. And of course, you had some very successful financial returns in all of that, uh, which is a, a common denominator of our two worlds. But in your, in, your, in your investment, how does that circle back to Polkum? The developing of the strategy, testing and confirming and pivoting in Qualcomm's main businesses. Yeah, yeah. It, it basically, I think one of the interesting thing is you mentioned our, you know, uh, I think the number from what I remember, the last seven years, like 18 unicorn exits, uh, probably 20 include some that is not in the seven year window. Um, um, actually, more than half of these are outside the US, right? And maybe 55%, 60%. I, I don't remember the exact count, but it's like, if it's 18, maybe maybe 10 outside the US, 18 US. And what that really tells you is that there is opportunity for value creation anywhere in the world where you can have smart people solving real problems in a, in a, you know in, a, in, in the right way, right? So I think that's fascinating. And the fact that we had, you know, great returns in LATAM corroborates that, hey, uh, you know, the, the point that, hey, yes, again, there's, there's real problems. Our technologies are being deployed and employed uh, to solve these real problems, right? So it helps uh, uh, corroborate the notion that, yes, we should continue to invest and, and, and uh, continue to be active in the market and look for more opportunities because, uh, again, the problems folks are solving there are different from the folks, the problems you see in, in, in Palo Alto, if you will, right? The opportunities are different. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it's basically it. Carlos, I think, it, uh, I think it would be super interesting to understand a bit, a bit better how you guys work internally, uh, uh, as long as, as you can say. Cause, and I'm asking this, so let me frame the, que the question in a different way. To put ourselves, or, or for the founders that are listening to us, I think one of the questions that we often get, even ourselves when, we, when we're on the cap table and they're talking to, to corporate investors, is what kind of value is the corporate investor going gonna, gonna to give me? beyond the financial aspect of, of the investment. And as you said now, I mean, there's a strategic hat, but there's also the financial hat. And when we've looked and analyzed other CBCs or corporate venture programs out there, uh, uh, there's always this question about, hey, you're going to get money from, from this CBC. But then another, another different question is, how are you going to get value from the CBC? And there's a lot of, uh, and there's a lot that the that the corporate or the company needs to do, the corporate investor needs to do internally, so that providing value to these companies is not like a labyrinth uh, to 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 navigate a corporate with all the complications that that entails. So, how do you guys operate in that respect? I mean, how are you set up as a as a firm, as a company, to be able to provide value to the to the to the startups, given the size that you have as a company? Uh, what kind of value can founders expect from you? What, what can you tell us about that? That's a great question. Um, indeed, uh, again, if you rewind some 20 years ago, uh, when the number of CBCs was much, was much smaller, et cetera, uh, and CBCs were effectively you know, starting out at that time, uh, I'd say they were much more heavy handed right, than they are today. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing this for 23 years. Um, we've really, you know, sort of developed and refined our playbook uh, in a way that we can uh, contribute and add to the companies and to the co-investors versus be a pain in the butt, right? And so some of the things that come to mind is um, independent thinking, uh, you know, in our approval process, our team makes the decisions of where to invest in, in terms of uh, there's uh, effectively no uh, interference from the business, from the business units, right? Um, we do consult with them, actually say, what do you think? Does this make sense? Is this helpful, complementary, etc.? 
but we, you know, the team makes the decision. Yeah, we think this this will be a good investment, and we think we can help with them. So it's very collaborative. Back to your point, we do consult with them. Um, they don't really have a veto power on the deals, but again, we listen. Right? Associated with this is speed. We you have to move fast. You have to feel confident about what you're doing. You have to make decisions fast. It you can't take. A long, long time to say yes, I'm in. No, I'm not, right? And uh, again, this is something that we've refined over time. We can say quickly, yeah, this is something we want to double click on. We want to move, and we'll make a push to get approved, right? Or no, we think uh, you know we really don't believe, etc. Um, and and so this combination of independence, speed are key tenets uh, to be a successful CBC, and I think uh, we, we've done it well. We really, really, really avoid investing in companies that are sort of uh, competitive to us, right? Because it's just very difficult to manage. You could argue sometimes, well, invest in this because if our internal effort doesn't work, we have a hedge, et cetera. It's just very difficult. So we make that conscious decision, you know, 99.9% of the time not to go there. So again, we established that, hey, Yes, we have an interest here. Yes, we have an internal development. So we, we tell the entrepreneurs, hey, uh, yeah, I see what you're doing. I get it. We know the problem is real. In fact, we're trying to you know go after the market as well, right? But we will disengage. So this is another story where, again, we operate uh, quickly and freely and, and uh, with independence of thought. So that's sort of the first bucket is, you know, uh, make a decision quickly uh, transparently or get out of the way. The second piece is, again, we focus on companies where we believe that we can, um, you know, use our network, uh, either upstream or downstream, our network of partners, right? Customers, channel partners, uh, um, maybe suppliers, depending on what the company is, and collaborate with, with those startups to open doors for them that otherwise would be very hard for them to do, right? Uh, and did it for internal efforts, right? So we give them access to engineers and say, hey, hey, uh, think about this. We give them early access to some products. Why don't you try this? Let us know what you think. Why don't you build your solution on this first? It's not commercially available yet, but you know you can start to play with it. And maybe when we launch it, you'll have a leg up on the market, etc. So those are things we do uh, to basically uh, uh, help the companies differentiate themselves and grow, right? Uh, so this special care, uh, this sharing of knowledge, sharing of market feedback, hey, we've seen this play out here in this market, et cetera. You may want to think about that. So uh, there's a lot of, again, dialogue with the mothership, with our partners in trying to help the companies, right? Um, and know when is it that we actually can help and, you know, Sometimes it's just difficult to pull off, but, but you know, uh, we, we at least try, we do the best efforts. And before, back to your process uh, question on what's our decision process, as part of our decision to move forward or not, we actually identify what are the touch points with us and what is my plan to work with this company once I invested uh, to help, right? And again, it takes... Uh, you know, it takes both sides wanting to do it, right? We don't force anything, so it's all arm's length. Uh, but we try to orchestrate that opportunity that we thought, hey, this is an opportunity to collaborate, and we try to orchestrate, and we have some folks internally part of the team uh, who do sort of this hand-holding, the BD function, to try to navigate, uh, you know, the mothership. And, and we also have some folks trying to help uh, navigate partners of ours, customers of ours to introduce. So uh, one example, um, we we invested in a company that is doing basically uh, cashierless checkout. Think think uh, Amazon Go, okay. right? Uh, the company is a leader in the space called iFi. Um, we're introducing them to the likes of Walmart and to others, et cetera, which are customers of ours, right? trying to get them to, you know, do a business, that introduction is done. Now it's up to them to try to make it happen, right? We can't force it. It's arm's length again. But, uh, uh, you know, just one example of uh, how we work with our ecosystem, with our partners, 
and our portfolio companies to, to help. So in this case, we'd actually had our collaborated with our sales team who calls on, you know, Walmart and other retailers. And we basically said, here's the company. Uh, here's what they do. By the way, this is a company that we're working with them. Our engineering team is working with them to, to get their solutions to run better on our, our, our solutions, right? So there's also some uh, handholding there and some uh, access to some of our solutions and, and helping port uh, and, and, you know, with the fact that it should run, uh, you know, faster, cheaper, classical, faster, cheaper. And do you use the learnings and experiences of the portfolio companies into developing new use cases or, or new products in the mothership? Definitely. Definitely. We use the learnings of the portfolio companies to sort of share, uh, glean insights and share those with our, you know, mothership you know, general managers of different units, hey, we're seeing this trend, we're seeing this happen, we've seen the folks try to do this, didn't work, et cetera. So we do that. And and we also, you know, use the learnings in general to basically say, how can we build better products? How can we, uh, you know, there's demand in the market for a solution like this, which is not quite the same as ours. Should we improve? So that's part of the value that we get as an investor, right? The strategic value, we get the financial returns and then we get these sort of insights and the ability to generate insights and learnings that we can share with the, the mothership. And so all of these are very positive. Uh, you know, our CFO is happy. The general managers of the business units are happy with our activity, right? Uh, and that's sort of what constitutes sort of a healthy uh, CBC function, if you will. Carlos, before before we hit record, uh, I mean, you said something that I wrote down that I think it's super interesting, and it kind of touches with what what you're discussing. But I, I would like to know if you have more to share there, and whether that's like a, with a CBC hat or with more of the CK or the Carlos uh, investor hat. You said something that you've learned quite a bit about when to invest, when not to invest, how to invest, and how to pick the right investors. Uh, so I don't know if you buy that. You, you're talking more about about Qualcomm Ventures, for example, or you, Carlos, as an individual investor working for a firm. But w- w- what can you tell us uh, about about this? Because I guess that, I mean, one thing in, in VC is access, but a, another big one is like how to make investment decisions, and, and especially yeah. as an individual. Yeah. So let me start with the... Uh, uh, you know, with sort of how, when should Qualcomm Ventures invest first, right? So we have over time really limited the number of investments where, we, you know, if we're leading around, we want a board director seat or we want, if not leading, we, we would still strive to get the board observer, right? So we are more and more looking to do deals where we have at least a board observer, and if we don't, we will think seriously whether we should invest or not. Because, you know, again, a lot of the learnings that we hope to get from this, a lot of the ability to help the company um, and vice versa are not there if you're not at the table, right? So this is something that we've, again, refined over time. Um, uh, strong believers of, again, having a seat at the table, right? Um, of course, there are exceptions. In some cases, we still invest without that, but it's very rare. Right, it has to be something very unique, very special, uh, and we look for other ways to try to get the access and the dialogue, keep the dialogue going. Right, so that that's that. Um, from a sort of personal standpoint, and and uh, you know our team, right? Obviously, just like every firm, we have we discuss pipeline, we discuss the merits, we discuss the uh, you know what we like, what we don't like, what are some of the things that we must get. There's no perfect deal, right? So there's always something. The question is you have to weigh is is this, uh, can we live with this, right? It's not ideal, but can we live with this or not? So we use the, um, in, in many senses, the sort of the collective experience. And as you know, there's a lot of sort of pattern matching in VC. So, hey, I've seen this play out and it wasn't a good story or, you know, whatnot. So we try to avoid the, the you know, obviously we do our very best to avoid the obvious pitfalls, right? But again, it's uh, it, it, more, more, most of the time it's sort of some, some gray shade 
uh, shade of gray of you know of of what it is with the team or with the go to market the business uh, etc so that again discussions with the team okay is this the right time to invest and it does happen that hey we really like the opportunity we like the founder we just think maybe we want to play out you know uh one round and come in the next round so we stay in touch uh, understanding that we're likely to pay more right but just gives us some more comfort to uh, come in a little later with when when there's uh, you know fewer uncertainties, if you will, or some of the bet is materializing, right? And again, a lot of this is sort of discussions within the team. Um, obviously, we don't you know eventually folks uh, a set of folks vote on the deal. It doesn't need to be unanimous, right? Basically, we allow for dissent. We allow for, uh, hey, I, you know, I'm, I really don't see it, but you're, you've, you've got a lot of conviction and uh, you've worked a lot on this. You're much closer than I am. So, you know, go ahead and, and make the investment. And of course, once we make the investment, we all join band together in trying to help the company grow and be successful. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Good. One last question, Carlos. Uh, you, were, you were saying that you, you became global. Uh, so Qualcomm Ventures invest in, in all over the world, especially specifically in seven regions, right? US, China, India, Israel, Europe, Latin America, and Korea. What would you be able to comment to us? What are the similarities and differences between founders, startups, developing uh, um, stages and so forth in all these regions? <laughs> Good question. Well, similarities is uh, capital and the right set of investors, uh, you know, can definitely help companies grow, right? And and uh, uh, so it's, it takes more than capital. It takes experience. It takes uh, sort of rolling up your sleeve and helping build a company. And that's that's very true everywhere, right? Whether India or China or whatnot. Uh, I think also similar is motivation for uh, most entrepreneurs is to try to build something big and, you know, uh, deliver value for the investors and, 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 and for themselves. Um, the the uh, different markets have different areas where um, they are sort of like their maybe comparative advantage, if you will, right? Um, and or different needs. So, uh, for example, Israel is quite known to be sort of a powerhouse in cyber uh, and communications in general, right? Uh, I don't think you'll find a whole lot of qualified deals for this in, in LATAM, for example, right? It's just more part of the training that the folks get uh, and the needs, the real life needs, et cetera. So you just see a lot more talent and, uh, uh, you know, supply quote unquote, of opportunities to invest in this area, right? Um, at the same time, uh, pick another example. Uh, we saw, for example, China being super creative uh, over the past 10 decades with new business models, with new ideas that, you know, were un unthought of, right? So the whole, the whole bike sharing phenomena, for example, right, which then morphed into uh, scooters and whatnot, right? But it's, they're all derivatives of the same thing. That's actually something that started out there when people said, hey, you know, I can do this. Uh, you know, every big city has this issue of, uh, you know, congested traffic and it makes a lot more sense to, 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 to try to move in the bicycle on a scooter, right? And you want to have something that, uh, uh, and this is an interesting touch point for us, right? So, these are connected uh, intelligent systems, if you will, right? It, you got a compute uh, in the bike and you got a connectivity module, right? Uh, a lot of, a lot of these bikes and scooters or whatever use our technology. Um, and so this was, again, the one of the manifestations of the Internet of Things, the bike is a thing, uh, that the Chinese saw, hey, we have this opportunity now to put a module in computer and communications. They can talk in the cloud. I know where it is, right? Folks have an app on their phone. They can unlock it with the app. I have the payment through my system, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to get to is 
we see folks, uh, you know, again, solving different problems that sometimes go global, uh, way beyond the U.S., right? And we see some folks doing, you know, some very uh, specific things. So Quinto Andar is not something that would probably get as much opportunity in the U.S. as in Brazil and Latam because it's just a very different. Quinto Andar started out as a sort of a property rental market, right? And I remember when I went back to Brazil in 07, 08, uh, we, you know, my wife said, oh, let's not buy, let's rent first. It's just a nightmare. It's like a 50 day process, you know, super slow, super bureaucratic, um, et cetera. In the end, we actually gave up. I said, let's just buy because it's a pain, <laughs> right? Uh, Quintandar is taking that 40, 50 day process down to a three day process, all digital, all on the cloud, all mobile. Uh, so fascinating. Again, the, the pain point's not the same here right, uh, in the U.S. So you see in different geographies people solving uh, local needs, local, local, uh, you know, content is obviously one, but even business processes um, is, is another one. So I think that's, again, that's what's fascinating to have a global platform because we see, we see this, uh, you know, uh, the manifestations of creativity, entrepreneur, energy, et cetera, you know, different in every geography and whatnot. Um, historically, um, for many years, China was very expensive. China is much cheaper now, unfortunately, because of the, you know, so, some of the sort of the, the more risks associated with investing. But I remember when I joined, especially 2015, 16, you know, the China deals were like the multiples were something else. Now, they have uh, very active capital markets and the capital markets, the multiple on those markets are uh, quite healthy, Right. So, uh, and so we've made great exits there as well, but, you know, again, you get some things where, uh, you know, there's sometimes, uh, you know, different, different pricing, if you will, uh, though that's changing and quickly becoming very similar, but it, that's, that's another difference. Very interesting. Uh, Carlos, last two questions uh, before we wrap up. Uh, the two questions that we ask every single guest that comes to the podcast. Can you recommend us a book or some form, of, some form, some other form of content? Content, and can you also recommend us someone to invite to the podcast? Yeah, I don't know if you've talked. Let me start with the second one. Uh, um, a big fan of Edson Higonacci. I don't know if you've talked to them. You're already. not going to believe it. Uh, we will have him like. tomorrow. <laughs> on the schedule for tomorrow morning. Great minds think alike. Uh, absolute fan of the work he's done. Edson again started Estella circa 2006, so when it wasn't obvious, and you know started with a sort of a small fund him and and uh, and uh, Andrea and and uh, it's just it's just great to see what they've done. They are uh, like this powerhouse of helping entrepreneurs and, and, and digest things, et cetera. We're actually looking at a deal together now. So uh, that's one. Um, so uh, in terms of content, uh, that's, a, that's a question. I, it's, a, it's a great question. Maybe I wish I had uh, uh, some difficult to pick one, uh, you know, uh, maybe a little preview, but um I'm a big fan of podcasts. Podcasts are easy to consume, right? You can consume them walking your dog. You can consume in the, you know, in the treadmill, whatnot. So, um, and there's a wealth of them. Uh, one that I've been listening to, uh, uh, a couple that I've been listening to lately. One is Business Breakdown Breakdowns. So we'll talk to you about uh, the business models and, and, and whatnot. So that's that's a good one. And the other one is, uh, uh, I forgot the name, it's the Rosenthal guy. Acquired. Uh, oh, the two guys. Acquired. 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 Yes, thank you. Yes, I love it. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. They do these three-hour podcasts that obviously you can't consume at once. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the sort of, 
the depth that they go into the history of the company and how things evolved and some of the decisions that were made, et cetera. I just think it's uh, it's fascinating. So this these are just a couple. There's there's a lot more. You know, there's all in. There is uh, all that. So podcasts are great. Uh, love blogs as well. Just a little harder to 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 consume. Right, it requires a little more focus, a little more attention, but that's good. So hopefully this is uh, uh, good enough, and hopefully you're not talking to them tomorrow. As well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unfortunately not, but yeah, it is. A, it's a great podcast. CK, thanks a ton. I know you're a busy man, so we really appreciate you doing this. Uh, and hopefully this is not the last time we talk, and maybe we we can also co-invest in the future. It was a pleasure. Would love to co-invest and. Uh, uh, busy, no busy. We're all busy, so it's a it's a matter of uh, you know just the decisions you make on how you spend your day. So it's good. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys, and uh, good luck with the uh, your expansion, and good luck with the investments in Brazil and Latam. And uh, uh, would love to stay in touch. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you guys for the opportunity.